What? Ready? Today, because they are making a video recording, I will not follow the normal route as we follow, we will do something special. A very powerful portion of Savitri that Mother herself has recited. I am going to recite that now because it is, has the power of mantra. Very powerful. But what exactly is mantra? People who don't know, it is a sound word that carry the effect in the sound more than the meaning. The, the sound of mantra carries in the great force. And so Savitri, the whole of Savitri actually is a mantra. And if you want to listen to Savitri and understand it, you should listen and understand it as if it is a mantra. And how does one hear a mantra? Sri Aurobindo himself has explained, so I will first tell you that. As when the mantra sinks in yoga's ear, its message enters, stirring the blind brain, and keeps in the dim ignorant cells its sound. The hearer understands a form of words, and musing, on the index thought it holds, he strives to read it with his laboring mind, but finds bright hints, not the embodied truth. Then falling silent in himself to know, he meets the deeper listening of his soul. The word repeats itself in its rhythmic strains. Thought vision, feeling, sense, the body self are seized unutterably and he endures an ecstasy and an immortal change. He feels a wideness and becomes a power. All knowledge rushes on him like a sea. Transmuted by the white spiritual ray, he walks in naked heavens of joy and calm, sees the God face and hears transcendent speech. This is from Savitri itself and this is how we have to listen to mantra. So now I will start this passage. <clears throat> Choose spirit thy supreme choice not given again. For now from my highest being looks at thee the nameless, formless peace where all things rest. In a happy vast sublime cessation know, an immense extinction in eternity, a point that disappears in the infinite, felicity of the extinguished flame, Last sinking of a wave in a boundless sea, end of the trouble of thy wandering thoughts, close of the journey of thy pilgrim soul. Accept, O music, weariness of thy notes, O stream, wide breaking of thy channel banks. <coughs> The moments fell into eternity, but someone yearned within a bosom unknown, and silently the woman's heart replied, Thy peace, O Lord, a boon within to keep amid the roar and ruin of wild time for the magnificent soul of man on earth. Thy calm, O Lord, that bears thy hands of joy. 
limitless like ocean round a lonely isle, a second time the eternal cry arose. Wide open are the ineffable gates in front. My spirit leans down to break the knot of earth, amorous of oneness, without thought or sign, to cast down wall and fence, to strip heaven bare, see with the large eye of infinity, unweave the stars, and into silence pass. In an immense and world-destroying pause, she heard a million creatures cry to her. Through the tremendous stillness of her thoughts, immeasurably the woman's nature spoke. Thy oneness, Lord, in many approaching hearts, my sweet infinity of thy numberless souls. Mightily retreating like a sea in ebb, a third time swelled the great admonishing call. I spread abroad the refuge of my wings, out of its incommunicable deeps my power looks forth of mightiest splendor stilled into its majesty of sleep withdrawn above the dreadful whirlings of the world. A sob of things was answered to the voice and passionately the woman's heart replied. Thy energy, Lord, to seize on woman and man, to take all things and creatures in their grief and gather them into a mother's arms. Solemn and distant like a seraph's lyre, a last great time the warning sound was heard. I open the winding knot of pain. Thy joy, O Lord, in which all creatures breathe, Thy magic flowing waters of deep love, Thy sweetness give to me for earth and men. Then after silence a still blissful cry began such as arose from the infinite, when the first whisperings of a strange delight imagined in this, its deep the joy to seek, the passion to discover and to touch, the enamored laugh which rhymed the chanting world. O oh, beautiful body of the incarnate world, all thou hast asked I give to earth and men. Or shall be written out in destiny's book by my trustee of thought and plan and act, the executor of my will, eternal time. But since thou hast refused my nameless calm and turned from my termless peace in which is expunged the visage, the visage of space, and the shape of time is lost, and from happy extinction of thy separate self in my uncompanioned Lord Eternity, for not for thee the nameless, worldless nought, annihilation of thy living soul, and the end of thought and hope and life and love in the black measureless are I lay my hands upon thy soul of flame. I lay my hands upon thy heart of love. I yoke thee to my power of work in time. Because thou hast obeyed my timeless will, because thou hast chosen to share earth's struggle and fate, and lean in pity over earth-bound men, and turned aside to help and yearned to save, I bind by thy heart's passion, thy heart to mine, 
and lay my splendid yoke upon thy soul. Now will I do in thee my marvellous works. I will fasten thy nature with my cords of strength, subdue to my delight thy spirit's limbs, and make thee a vivid knot of all my bliss, and build in thee my proud and crystal home. Thy days shall be my shafts of power and light, thy nights my starry mysteries of joy, and all my clouds lie tangled <coughs> in thy hair, and all my springtides marry in thy mouth. O sun world, thou shalt raise the earth's soul to light, and bring down God into the lives of men. Earth shall be my work chamber and my house, my garden of life to plant a seed divine. When all thy work in human time is done, the mind of earth shall be a home of life, the life of earth a tree growing towards heaven the body of earth, a tabernacle of God. Awakened from the mortal's ignorance, men shall be lit with the eternal's ray and the glory of my sun lift in their thoughts and feel in their hearts the sweetness of my love and in their acts my power's miraculous drive. <coughs> My will shall be the meaning of their days, living for me, by me, in me they shall live. In the heart of my creation's mystery, I will enact the drama of thy soul, inscribe the long romance of thee and me. I will pursue thee across the centuries. Thou shalt be hunted through the world by love. Naked of ignorance protecting veil, and without covered from my radiant gods, no shape shall screen thee from my divine desire. Nowhere shalt thou escape my living eyes. In the nudity of thy discovered self, in a bare identity with all that is, disrobed of thy covering of humanity, divested of the dense veil of human thought, made one with every mind and body and heart, made one with all nature and with self and God, summing in thy single soul my mystic world, I will possess in thee my universe. The universe find all I am in thee. Thou shalt bear all things that all things may change. Thou shalt fill all with my splendor and my bliss. Thou shalt meet all with thy transmuting soul. Assailed by my infinitudes above and quivering in immensities below, pursued by me through my mind all this vast, oceanic with the surges of my life, and respond to me from every nerve. A vision shall compel thy coursing breath, thy heart shall drive thee on the wheel of works, Thy mind shall urge thee through to love me in the noble and the vile, in beautiful things and terrible desire. My fragrance sees thee in the jasmine snare. My eyes, my dreadful hands laid on thy bosom shall force thy being bathed in fiercest long melodies and roll my foaming wave in seas of love. 
Even my disastrous clutch shall be to thee the ordeal of my rapture's contrary shape. In pain self shall smile on thee, my steps of the world's delight. Their life experience is tumultuous shock in the mutual craving of two opposites. Hearts tell the ancient music of the spheres in the revealing accents of thy voice and nearer draw to me because thou art. Enamoured of thy spirit's love in thy soul, hear in thy love the beauty of it. I spare thee not my living fires, but make thee a channel for my timeless force. My hidden presence led thee unknowing on me from thy beginning slave of God. O lasso of my rapture's widening news, become my cord of universal love. The spirit ensnared by thee, forced to delight of creation's oneness, sweet and fathomless, compelled to embrace my myriad unities and all my endless forms, would cry out the immortal litany. Well, I'll come there now. I'm finished. No. <laughs> That's what I was you. Can you tell us what you just read now? And what is in it? You see, the whole of Savitri is what Mother called a mantra. She told me it is a mantra for the transformation of the world. And mantra, as I told you, is something you can't understand with the mind, you must understand with the soul. So we repeat it and we don't know what is going to happen because it's all subtle, very subtle things happen. We are not able to see, but there is something that's happening. Every time I recite Savitri, something happens in the world. It's a very powerful mantra. That's all I can tell you. And these are all occult things, so we can't explain them physically. Now, occultism is a very strange thing. Mother herself was a very great occultist. She studied in Algiers under Mr. Theo. He was a very famous man and mother knew occultism. 
But the occultism that is known in the world is not spiritual. It is mostly vital and mental. <coughs> and it can be dangerous. Because the vital and mental are not so well protected like the spirit. When I say spiritual, you must not misunderstand. People think spiritual has got to do with God and religion. No. Spiritual is that to do with the spirit. That's all. Mind has got mental, life has got vital, body is physical, spirit is spiritual. What is the spirit? We have something, we have got a body, we've got life, we've got mind, we've got a fourth thing. We're not aware of it. In, 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 in religion they call it a soul, arm, Musabe. But people don't know it, they call it, give it a name, but they don't know it. No, no, very few people know what is the soul. They hear about it in the church and they pray for it, they use the word soul, but they don't know what it is. When what's the first, the soul is asleep. There is a very small passage from Savitri. If the chamber's door is even a little ajar, what then can hinder God from stealing in? Or who forbid his kiss on the sleeping soul? So God has to come and kiss your soul, then the soul wakes. You understand? So it is a very happy thing, the soul. So even if you don't know it, you can at least imagine it. It's a beautiful thing. And the spirit is the thing that deal with the soul. It's nothing to do with the mind. It's nothing to do with the life. It has its own way of knowing. Mind knows by reason, by rationality, by ratio. A is equal to B and B is equal to C. So A is equal to C. That's called ratio. And mind is rational. And so it will go by reason. The spirit doesn't go by reason. The spirit goes by vision. It sees. That is the difference. So the vision doesn't think, it sees. So I'll give you a small passage from Savitri, if you like, that gives us. Mm -hmm. King Ashwa, in Savitri, Sri Aurobindo has chosen Savitri first to describe his own yoga. What are you reading? What I'm reading there is the yoga of Sri Aurobindo, but in the book he puts it as the yoga of King Ashwapati the father of Savitri, but his own yoga he is describing. The yoga of the mother is in the yoga of Savitri. So this thing contained, but he put it in the form of a story. But in this uh, passage, How shall I rest content with mortal days and the dull measure of terrestrial life? I, who have seen behind the cosmic veil the glory and the beauty of thy face, hard is the doom to which thou binds thy sons. How long shall our spirits battle with the night and bear defeat and the brute yoke of death? We who are vessels of a deathless force and builders of the Godhead of the race, or if it is thy work I do below, amid the error and strife of human mind, in the vague light of man's half-conscious mind, why breaks not in some distant gleam of thee? Ever the centuries and millenniums pass, where in the grayness is thy coming's ray? Where is the thunder of thy victory's wings? Only we hear the feet of passing gods. It's a very sad line. Yes, All the gods, gods come, they stay, they go away. We've had Rama, we've had Krishna, we've had Christ, we've had Allah, we have this, we have all the gods come. We accept them all. They come, they stay, they go away. Even Shubhan has gone away, Mother has gone away. And we only hear their feet passing away. That's all. One second, Uda. Has mother come here? What has she? She had was she was destined to come. One second. Udar here. The Lilu is not here, she won't come back. So I ask you the question differently. 
Why has mother come here? She came here because she was destined to come. She had a role to play and it was her destiny that brought her here. There's no question of why or what, because the divine has no why. When I asked mother this question once, she told me the divine doesn't act by reason. So there's no why. The divine acts, the divine acts. On accept. accept. <laughs> there's no why. But she had to come, she came. And uh, what has she done here? You see, according to the Indian tradition, which is based on very ancient knowledge, the, 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 all the divine force acts in this way. It has first what we call the male portion of it. We call it the Purusha, we call him the Lord, the Purusha. The Purusha is the man who brings out the force, who is the witness, who is the man supporting the whole movement. But the actual person who acts in front is the feminine side of it. We call it the Shakti. Prakriti, we call it the Shakti. The mother is the active principle. Sri was the support. So it was she that built up the ashram. Mother has done it. But Sri is standing behind and supporting the whole thing. So this mother, you may call it Sri the ashram, but the mother has built it up. And that is the...